Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to the first Friday Power of Storytime. I am Kate, the creative director of Con Card Books uh, and uh. Z Girls Press. And today we are going to be reading you the first half of a short story from What Goes Unseen and Other Tales from Afar um, by author Sean Minster. He's a, a millennial like me, but he was really inspired by a bunch of childhood adventures, classic literature and movies, and even some songs to create some really weird and wonderful stories in here. Um, they span the gambit, everything from adventuring in the forest to carousing with pirates and everything in between. And they're very, very interesting journey. Um, and the artwork, which you can see some of right here, was done by his sister, Rosie Minster. This is a picture from the story we're going to be reading today. This is the Hodag. And uh, this is the original artwork that became this cover. Um, part of what we do is create books that will stand out in the market and will... <laughs> Here, I'll show you better. And will represent the content of the book. And this artwork, the original artwork, is absolutely beautiful and captivating. Um, but it's very bright and light and the stories are quite dark and complex so we had to uh, use the cover artwork in the final form to show the depth and the darkness and the complexity so it's still got all the original beauty there the great green glowing eyes and this wonderful detailed face but it also has the the moodiness and the complexity that you'll find inside the book too so um we'll start reading what goes and seeing other tales from afar in a second um but before that, I do want to say that on Wednesdays at noon uh, Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time, we also read uh, kids and middle grade books. So we're going to be reading a little bit from The Passage of Moose Beach by Michael Foster. Um, so please join us then as well. And every Friday we read books for adults. And we're, we're starting off with one of the lighter tales today because it's hard out there right now. <laughs> but but we'll, we'll do some other interesting stories and we've got some other books we'll be reading from as well. So if you enjoy this, definitely tune in. So this is The Great Hodag Hunt. A summer sun sat lazily in the mid-morning sky, peeking here and th there through creamy, strolling clouds. Crisp, clean air mingled about. It harbored a soft energy that could be employed as easily as it could be ignored. A green canopy dominated the horizon, resting over the dark brown stilts and shading the soft, mulchy substrate beneath. Jenna sat against the base of the picnic table at the edge of the forest. It wasn't really the edge of the forest. Trees were thick in all directions from where she sat, but this neglected dead end picnic spot was the start of the real forest. In one direction, there were houses, roads, and eventually some shops and whatever else made up their small town. The other way was wild and real, stretching as far as Jenna could imagine. She grabbed at twigs, snapping them thoughtlessly as her mind drifted in no particular direction. Eventually, motion up the road caught her eye. Two bikes sped towards her, carrying two familiar figures, Derek and Mikey. Mikey, the smaller of the two, was pedaling like a madman just to keep up, while his older brother took longer, more powerful strides as he gradually slipped ahead. Realizing he was about to lose, Mikey dropped into a lower gear and used all his force to keep up a rhythm. Derek, confident in his lead, didn't notice until his brother was next to him and moving towards the lead. As the end of the road drew nearer, Derek had to act fast or admit defeat to his little brother, with witnesses too. A bead of sweat rolled down Derek's brow as anticipated embarrassment flickered into his mind. He punched down on the pedals, pulling against the handlebars for extra torque. They were in the final stretch of it now. Mikey had the lead by an inch, but Derek was right behind. The curb was only a few bike lengths ahead when they slammed on their brakes. Mikey braked harder, leaving Derek to shoot past his brother in the final feet, rocketing up the curb that Mikey halted inches short of. An improvised wheelie allowed Derek's front tire to barely clear the concrete lip but the back tire slammed in hard, throwing him clear over the handlebars. He tumbled through the air, wide-eyed, flailing wildly, until the very last second when he tucked into a roll. Derek spun over once, hitting a soft pile of pine needles and bark, before a fallen branch caught his backpack and he skidded to a stop. 
The smell of freshly upturned pine compost bellowed into the air as Derek stirred. Dang, Jenna exclaimed, running up to Derek, who was still half buried in debris. You look like a baby ostrich who's learning to fly. No, I'm fine. Thanks for asking, Derek replied grumpily. And ostriches don't even fly. Exactly, Ma, <laughs> Jenna spouted as she burst into uncontrollable laughter. Derek sat up as Jenna regained her breath. She leaned over to examine him further. His mesh basketball shirt was covered in needles and one even stuck in his arm. Wait, no, she said through a giggle, plucking a needle from his arm. You look like a porcupine that was adopted by ostriches learning to fly. And she fell back into another fit of laughter. In the meantime, Mikey ran up more excited than concerned. I won, I won, he yelled as he came up to the others. No way, Derek returned defensively. The race was to the picnic spot. You were still in the road, but I was ahead of you. Your brother has a point, Mikey, Jenna chimed in. Besides, I think he earned the win with that scrape on his arm. What? Mikey protested. He didn't even stick the landing. His face stuck the landing, Jenna teased. Both she and Mikey cracked up at the comment. Derek got to his feet and brushed himself off. He found his forearm to be a little raw, but nothing else hurt. Even his bite came away relatively unscathed. Man, how far back is Sam? Derek asked Mikey when he finally collected himself. Probably on the other side of Rhinelander, based on her sense of directions, Mikey answered. Nah, her bike probably fell apart, Jenna figured. I don't know how she, how she even gets that thing to move. As they talked, Sam finally came into view down the end of the road. There was a pronounced wobble in her front wheel. The chain didn't quite seem to move in sync with her pedaling. She made her way to the group in her own time and hopped off, using her feet more than her brakes to come to a stop. Hey guys, she said in a huff, pulling a wrench from her pocket as she bent down to tighten up the front wheel. What happened to your arm? I beat Mikey here, is what happened, boasted Derek. Only because he dove off his bike to do it, Mikey added defensively. Derek played it off coolly, stating, hey, the win's a win. Whatever, Mikey returned, brushing off his obnoxious brother's gloves. I was faster and you know it. Then how come you lost? Derek prodded. Because my head isn't hard enough to land on like yours, came the quick reply. True, but you'd have been fine, Derek insisted. You have a nice soft butt head to land on instead. At least my butt's not covered in pine needles and squirrel crap, Mickey smirked. There's no squirrel crap on my butt, is there? Derek asked apprehensively, twisting around to look at his behind, doing a full spin and half in the process. <laughs> no, you're good, Mikey laughed. Ugh. Derek exhaled, tension between the two brothers simmering away. Everybody bring their gear, Sam asked, rising from her now fixed front wheel. Yeah, let's see what we all got to work with, Mikey agreed excitedly. Hang on, Derek intervened. Let's stash our bikes before we get too settled in. Good call, Sam concurred. The less we're seen or heard, the better. The group backtracked up the road a few hundred feet or so. As they walked, Sam told Jenna, I'm glad your dance class got canceled. It's too good of a day to have to come home early. Me too, Jenna agreed. I'm not as excited about this one as I thought I'd be. Is it the polka class? Derek prodded, knowing full well she hated taking polka. No, Jenna groaned as they walked down into the ditch. It's supposed to be modern hip-hop fusion thing, but it's just kind of churchy. Lame, Derek sang. They were always trying to make those cans and things sound fun, but it all ends up as a prayer circle. I know, Jenna agreed, striding up the small embankment. Hip-hop for Jesus is not the same as hip-hop. I don't even think they plan on teaching us any real dance moves. It's just a trick to lure in at-risk youths. Haha, <laughs> well it lured you in, Mikey laughed. Yeah, Derek joked. Maybe after this you'll switch to sugar-free gum and change those B pluses to A's. Shut up, Jenna said, brushing away their flack. I think I can convince my mom to let me drop it anyways. It's so dumb. The gang made their way down farther to a more hidden ditch where Jenna's bike already sat covered in a thick layer of browning pine branches. They nestled their bikes in similarly. No one ever came out that way, but it's always better not to leave your bike lying around in the open for anyone to steal. With their bikes stashed, they made for the picnic spot and began emptying their packs onto the table. Let's start with the important stuff, Jenna began. What does everyone have for snacks? We brought a bunch of granola bars, Derek answered as he and Mikey dumped a combined dozen from their packs. I've got a whole mess of cherry tomatoes from our garden, Sam added in, showing off her stuffed Ziploc bag already slightly smashed tomatoes. And I've got PB and J's for everyone, Jenna finished. You all bring a water bottle? Yes, yep, yeah, ma'am, answered the choir of voices. 
Okay, we're set for food for a week, Mikey huffed impatiently, not wanting to waste any more of their hunting time than necessary. How about the traps and weaponry? Did you bring the net, Sam? Got the net, Sam replied, showing off a bundle of gardener's trellis. And I've got my knife, a hammer, compass, trowel, and 16 and a half boxes of matches. Whoa, exclaimed Mikey. Let me see those. Later, answered Sam. The smell of even a single strike could send the hodag running for two miles away. Fine. How about you, Jenna? Get the rope? Yeah, I got it, Jenna said, producing a nicely tied bundle of coarse white boat line. Had to sneak it out of the garage, but my dad never uses it anyways. And five lemons. Very good, Sam commented. Some sunscreen and bug spray that my mod made me take, Jenna continued and a roll of toilet paper in case we're stuck out here for days. Why would we be stuck, Derek asked. And can't you just use leaves, you know? You can use all the leaves you want, Jenna informed him, but I came prepared. Besides, we're headed into the forest forest. We could get turned around or cut off from civilization by the hodag, or even like a bear or something. Well, what if you break your ankle trying to fly again? Yeah, I get it, Derek huffed, but we also brought a compass so we won't get lost. I've got a multi-tool and a whittler's knife, so we can sharpen some spears, some string if we got to make a rock spearhead and tie it to a stick, or if we got to go fishing, some band-aids and a towel in case we need to find the hodag and lead it somewhere. Smart, Sam noted. And I brought some duct tape, too, Mikey went on, because they say you can do anything with it if you need to bad enough. Oh, and most importantly, the bait. From his pack, Mikey pulled a plastic bag full of short white fur, is that really? Sam began. Yep. Pure, all natural, 100% genuine white bulldog hair. I had to go in every day for a week and get it from the groomer, but it was worth it. Ooh, nice. I think we're all set then, Jenna put forth confidently. Let's take a compass reading and get to it. And let's all have a swig of water too, Sam added. We need to keep hydrated so we're sharp and alert. With that, they took an initial compass reading, unscrewed their water bottles, and Derek raised his. To the hunt! To the hunt! They cheered and down a mighty swig each. All packed up, they set down the familiar path and entered into the north woods. Not a hundred yards in, Mikey piped up. That looks like a good snare spot, pointing to a natural channel between some brush. Yeah, Sam acknowledged, but we're still way too close to the road. Besides, we've been here like a thousand times. Our scent is probably all over the place. We need to go deeper, like a mile, or maybe a hundred if we want any sort of real chance of finding the hodag. I guess, Mikey admitted, it's just going to take forever to get there. Hunting is all about patience, Derek, Derek reminded Mikey. And if we want to catch the hodag, we're going to need to be master hunters starting right now. Got it, Mikey answered sternly. They marched on in silence until Mikey piped up again. Jenna, can you tell the story of the hodag? Master hunters are also quiet as the wind, Mikey, Derek scolded. I know, he huffed. But it's going to be a minute before we cross the creek. I figure we can talk until then. Besides, we should review our prey so we can get a plan of attack straightened out. We already have a plan of attack, Jenna said with a roll of her eyes. But fine, it would be a good idea to cover the intel. Deal, Derek agreed. But let's keep our voices down and try not to snap so many branches while you walk, guys. Ugh, so, Jenna began, putting her best storyteller's voice on. The Hodag, legendary local resident of the greater Rhinelander area. Didn't you do a book report on this once, Derek interrupted, when Jenna sounded too formal. It was Forensics Club, and they said to choose something real, Jenna lamented. They can't prove it's not, Mikey exclaimed. That's what I said, agreed and now worked up Jenna. Anyway, they missed out, and now you guys get to hear it. So, she began again regaining her composure. Known to be mischievous and even playful, the hodag is a sensitive creature, often self-conscious of how ugly and smelly people think they are. Apparently, they stink like a skunk or fisher. They're very good at hiding, even in plain sight, and are ferocious, formidable creatures when provoked. So we should hunt with our noses, Sam commented as she plucked a leaf from a passing tree, crumpling it beneath her nose. Like when we won that game of Capture the Flag because Mikey tried to get away with a silent fart, Derek chuckled. That's probably pretty close, actually, yeah, Jenna agreed. But if we actually see one, the typical description is a stout, is a stout long creature, sort of shaped like a crocodile, 
but with taller, more upright legs like a dinosaur. Its back is ridged with spikes all the way to the sharp protruding tip of its tail. They say it can grow up to seven feet long and 280 pounds, but I'm pretty sure they just keep getting bigger till they die. So really they could grow to the size of a school bus if their legs could still hold them up or whatever. Anyways, they're covered in short mottled green fur, which I think is actually primordial feathers like dinosaurs had, kind of like the down on a baby dick, duck, but different. <laughs> Jenna wasn't sure if the group was still listening. Mikey's gaze was wandering off into the wood. Derek distractedly tossed and caught a rock he picked up a few minutes back, and Sam looked thoroughly lost in thought. Jenna paused her story for a moment. The brief silent was answered by expectant glances from the group members. Content that their attention was still on her, Jenna went on. Their faces are the hardest to describe. People always say they have the face of an elephant, which never made sense to me because they don't have long trunks. But maybe the rest is like an elephant, just not the nose. And its head looks like a frog's, only it's got horns like a bull and gnashing fanged teeth like a saber-toothed tiger. Jenna watched Derek's face twist in confusion at this description, and Sam's brow furrowed deeply. Mikey looked at it as naturally as if he'd called a Granny Smith green as if she'd call it a Granny Smith green. Focusing on her mental picture, Jenna continued, oh, its claws are thick and sharp and good for digging or thrashing. They're so cunning at blending into the forest. And it's said that they sharpen their claws. They only sharpen their claws in ways that make it look like other animals' markings. So when they do, they imitate a buck rub or a bear mark, or sometimes even woodpecker holes. Only a true expert could notice the difference. And it's only after they looked at the mark really, really hard. Their favorite food is white bulldogs. Some people say it's their only food, and that's why they went extinct. But that's stupid, because how would they have survived before people got here? They do love white bulldog, though. They also eat deer fawn and buck antlers and maybe turtles and snakes and frogs and things like that. Amphibians, Sam corrected. But their diet is highly speculative, and they are an undoubtedly carnivores on some level. But it's also been postulated that they use their claws to dig for roots. And they might even be scavengers, not the ferocious hunters everyone makes them out to be. That'd be kind of lame, Mickey complained. Not really, Sam went on. They're still probably ferocious. I mean, look at hippos. They only eat plants and nothing beats a hippo in a fight. Not even a tiger? Derek asked. No way, Sam exclaimed. One chomp and the tiger would be smushed like a salamander. What about an elephant? Jenna asked. If it was in the water, the hippo would definitely win. And on land, it might be a fair fight. But elephants only eat plants too, so I guess it's the same either way. What about a killer whale? asked Mikey. That's cheating, Sam, said Sam. They'd never be in the same place anyways. So what? The orca would totally win. They even went against great white sharks, and they eat meat. Fine. The orca wins against the hippo, but my point is still the same. Diet doesn't determine if an animal is cool or not. Unless he's got a really cool diet, Derek chimed in. Like those water dragon things that only eat poisonous animals and then they keep the poison so they can have like eight different types of poison to use on things. Yeah, but those already look cool, Mikey argued. So their diet isn't what makes them cool. I mean, not all the way. What about those birds in Africa that eat poisonous snakes and scorpions and stuff, Derek offered. Yeah, those are pretty cool, Mikey admitted. But I get what Sam's saying. Anyway, Jenna butted back in. People first discovered the Hodag at the end of the 1800s. We've been in the area since before that, but like I said, they're masters of camouflage. So this guy, uh, I forget who, finds one and blows it up with dynamite because there's nothing else that seemed to work. Then a few years later, he finds another. I think he was looking for them that whole time after finding the first one. So he gets the another one. Only this time he uses a whole mess of chloroform to put it to sleep. And I think that killed it too, but it wasn't blown up. So he set it on display to show everyone and make some money. Then the world started get, then word started getting around about it. And then the Smithsonian Museum in DC wanted to check it out. The guy heard from his friend that once that happened, the government was gonna hunt a bunch of them for museums all over the country. Well, he knew there weren't a whole lot of hodags left. So he hatched a plan. Before the museum people came, he got rid of the body and made a fake one. And then he said he made the whole thing up and it was a hoax. Because if he didn't, there'd probably be none left. Now everyone in history thinks he's a liar, but few people in town know the truth. They quietly passed this along to their kids and they passed it to their kids. All the while, everyone agreed the original guy was a liar for all of time. 
At this point, the group had reached a steep little, uh, steep little hill trench along the path. As was customary, they ran down one side and let their momentum carry them up the other steeper embankment. Derek and Jenna made it up, needing only a palm on the dirt path for leverage. Mikey and Sam both snatched at roots, easily climbing the rest of the way up once they found their handholds. The creek wasn't too far ahead now. Not wanting her tail to drag on too long, Jenna began to wrap it up. There's been a few other sightings since then. Some of them are definitely made up, but the true ones are kept quieter than the rest. Like it's gotta be from someone in town's grandma or uncle telling you. And then they only know when you... <laughs> then they only tell you when they know you won't go spreading it. That's how you know. Lemons will kill it too. Good local intel. Otherwise, if it's a story that gets everywhere, that's just someone pretending. It's like a joke that everybody's in on, but the real joke is that it's not a joke. Some say they saw a hodag and everyone around the world laughs because they know it's not real, make believe, which is perfect cover. Wow, Mikey reflected, people are dumb. Yeah, but that's how the world works, Jen explained. If you can get a few people to believe a simple trick, suddenly everybody thinks it's true. So what are we gonna do with it once we catch it? Derek asked the group. I say it's our ticket to fame. Obviously we wanna keep it alive, but even a dead one would probably be worth like a million bucks to Ripley's Believe It or Not, or like the Guinness Book of World Records or someone. We need to study and document its special habits and properties, Sam began. But Mikey interrupted with, I say we eat it and gain its powers. Jenna brushed past the comment and said, we need to keep it and figure out what it eats and stuff. That way we can figure out the best habitat for it and how to protect it. That's basically where I was going, Sam returned, annoyed at the interruption. Yeah, but you'd rather see how its scales can be used to treat diphtheria or something weird like that, Jenna pointed out. They're meant to be free, not locked up in some laboratory. But you just said you wanted to keep it, Sam explained, just for a bit so we can understand it and maybe become its friends. But it's a monster, Mickey countered. You don't know that, Jenna burst out. Okay, okay, Derek calmed the group. When we catch the hodag, we'll try to get some scales or stool samples or whatever for proof for Sam to study. Then we'll make sure to help the hodag however we can, and then we'll help ourselves after that. Deal? Deal, the rest of the group agreed, satisfied for now by the extremely vague plan. They all knew there'd be some conflict of interest when the time came, but they'd deal with it after they caught the hodag. From there, the group carried on, mostly in silence until they came to the creek. Jen started tugging on a log, and Derek was quick to join in. After a moment of finagling, they had it balanced on the creek's bank, and the other, and another heave launched it over the edge. The far end struck fast between two rocks, while the close end sat just above the tip of the bank. Sam inspected the new bridge intently, then jumped from the bank and drove her feet down on the log, wedging it snugly into the earth below. Her dismount was not very graceful, and Sam's feet slipped in two different directions. She tumbled almost into the stream, earning a nice mud stripe down the side of her torso in the process. Unfazed, Sam stood and clambered back up to test their handiwork. It was surprisingly sound. Arms stretched for balance, she made her way down the log and then hopped the final quarter, uh, quarter of the stream to the other side. It was the first time any of them had gone beyond the creek. The others followed suit, balance beaming their way across the makeshift bridge without issue. Mikey nearly fell twice, and it ended up hugging the log. He shimmied back up the bank and then ran into the woods toward town. The others called out to him, but re he returned almost as soon as he left, now carrying a long stick that he was snapping twigs off of. Stepping onto the log again, he drove the stick into the stream. Satisfied that it wasn't going anywhere, Mikey leaned onto this hand railing and moved forward. He repeated the process until it was at the edge of the log. Then he drove his stick into the far bank. and pole vaulted to the other side, nearly falling backwards into the creek during the process. Gripping the dirt of the far bank, he relaxed noticeably and clambered his way up the rest to, to the rest of the gang. Their first challenge conquered, these brave hunters continued boldly into the forest beyond. They bushwhacked through thick undergrowth and dashed between rows of trees, then found themselves face to face with an ocean of poison ivy dotted with burrs. Step like a deer, Jenna whispered to Mikey as she plunged between the prickers. Showing off her dancer moves, Jenna lifted me almost to her chest and came down straight, toes pointed, perfectly placed between the plants. Another high step, moving her foot forward only once it was above most of the leaves, 
she completely avoided brushing the ivy. Two more steps, and she came to a log, which she stepped onto practically and practically ran across. The others followed cautiously, stepping awkwardly but effectively. The ivy patch spilled into a swampy area where the kids skirted, which the kids skirted, until it blended into meadow. On the far side of the meadow, where most of the forest was swallowed up, this patch by this patch of marsh, marsh, they found the perfect place to put their first hoed egg trap. A sturdy young tree, no longer a sapling, but not yet fully grown, sat adjacent to the natural pathway and out of the woods. It was springy, bending with some effort from Derek's weight, then forming a semicircle once Jenna and Mikey climbed on. Sam tied the rope off as near to the top as she could, below where the tree became too wiry. Mikey hopped down and helped Sam prop a large oblong rock on top of the rope, and then held the rock on its side until Sam came back with a stick to lean the rock on. Finally, Sam wrapped the rope once around the stick and tied the end into a snare spanning most of the narrow pathway. Its sides rested on some tall grass to keep the loop open. Jenna and Derek carefully climbed down from the tree. It flexed upward but stayed mostly bent. Now for the real test. Sam took a branch and steadily placed it through the snare and yanked. Nothing happened. The stick was too far wedged under the small boulder. Jenna and, Jer Jenna and Derek hopped back on the tree. Mikey heaved on the counterweight and he and Sam repositioned the stick so that it just barely kept up the rock in the most precarious of ways. Sam also moved the loop a notch nearer the top of the stick. Again, Jenna and Derek got down slowly. Sam placed her stick through the snare, and hardly a tug later, snap! The stick yanked out of their hands and skittered across the ground, flinging up into the air not a second later. It worked perfectly. They reset the trap, and Mikey added the finishing touch. He took out his bag of white bulldog hair and sprinkled the entire thing across the snare. Now all that was left was to drive the hodag into the snare, and their hunt would be a success. The gang avoided the forest at first, instead continuing along the march, marsh until it was too swampy to walk through. Then they cut into the trees, but kept pushing diagonally from the trap as much as possible. The plan was to walk in a wide semicircle, then spread out and sweep directly back to the trap. If anything was between them and the trap, it wouldn't be, dis it wouldn't be disturbed on the trip out, but it would be flushed directly toward the snare on their way back. That was the theory anyways. After a few minutes, they started to veer back inwards. Eventually, their location was roughly in line with the trap. They spread sideways about 20 yards apart from one another. Once in position, the group marched straight towards their trap. Not long after, the hunters found themselves back at their snare, having stirred up nothing more than a couple of birds. The kids were disappointed, but not deterred. This time, they would make an even bigger loop before heading trapward. After getting as far out as they'd been, then a little further, feet began to drag. Everyone was getting tired and hungry and a little frustrated at the apparent emptiness of these woods. A few huffs and sighs were escaping from their mouths now. Just as tension was starting to build, a rustle in the distance caught everyone's attention. Hodag? whispered Mikey, barely loud enough to be audible. The answer was another, louder rustle from the same direction. Sam and Derek reached for their knives, while Jenna patted at Sam's pack, attempting to locate the hammer. Mikey crouched, raising his walking stick slightly in both hands. Another rustle tore through the silence as the hunters stood frozen in their tracks. Finally, an extended scamper revealed a flash of bushy tail out of the back, out of and back into a shrub. The gang was smacked with, uh, the gang smacked into re relaxation at the sight. A squirrel? Sam looked to the group for confirmation. Nah, Derek said with a grin. It was way too big to be a squirrel. Not a hodag, though, Mickey contributed. Mikey contributed with mild irritation. A monkey, maybe? Jenna asked Mikey quizzically. He thought about it for a moment, and then his expression brightened. An unexpected response came from the bushes, coated with a thick Russian accent. Squirrel monkey boy. What? Sam became un began unsurely, but then she regained her composure quickly enough to finish with, Who are you? I am squirrel monkey boy. Squirrel monkey is a type of monkey. I am also boy. And why do you sound like that? Asked the still confused Sam. Because I'm Russian, answered the squirrel monkey boy with some snip. Why do you sound like that? He returned. Because I'm American, came the obvious answer. What are you doing out here? And why are you hiding in that bush? Hiding? I'm not hiding. I'm forging. It is lunchtime and I'm hungry. Why are you sneaking up on me? We're... We weren't trying to find you, Sam answered half apologetically. We were hunting for a hodag. I see. Now will you come out from that bush? 
Only if you promise not to shriek at my appearances. Some people cannot handle my exoticness. Fine, Sam said, we promise. There were a few seconds of wrestling within the bush, and sure enough, out popped what appeared to be a squirrel monkey boy. <laughs> he had a big bushy tail, fat fur ears, and dark whiskers on his face. Jenna also noticed what appeared to be a performer's vest. Are you part of the circus or something? She queried. Da, came the simple reply after a pause. That means yes, Sam whispered to Derek as an aside. I know what it means, Derek whispered back, annoyed. You don't seem so sure about that, Jenna prodded Squirrel Monkey Boy. Okay, okay, I confess, I ran away from the circus. You ran away from the circus, repeated Jenna. Yep, Squirrel Monkey Boy answered furiously. Ran away from circus. We ran away from circus. Uh, it wasn't working out. We? questioned Derek. There are several other performers with me, back at the caravan. Can we come? asked Jenna excitedly. Uh, to the caravan? She added when he stared back blankly. Sam shot a look that yelled, Are you crazy? but didn't protest further than that. No, came the firm reply. But, uh, yes, I think that would be okay actually, but only for lunch. Deal, Janet agreed. We'll have to be getting back to the hunt anyway. Is good, is good. Come to, come, camp is over this way, I think. With that, Squirrel Monkey Boy took off into the woods, bounding on all fours for a moment before collecting himself with a shake of the head and standing upright. The kids scrambled to catch up and eventually fell in stride with the Critter Man. After a minute or two of silence, the Squirrel Monkey Boy spoke up. So what is this Kodag? The children looked amongst themselves for a moment, unsure how much they should tell a stranger. Uh, it's just kind of like a joke, I guess, Derek offered up after a pause. A monster, supposedly. Supposedly, Sam corrected. Corrected. Supposedly inhabits the wood, Derek continued stubbornly. But they're not actually real, we're just pretending. I see, answered the Russian, as he eyed them specifically. Very sneaky for a game of pretend. Well, it wouldn't be much fun otherwise, Derek explained. That's like the whole game. I suppose it is. The Russian returned with a wary eye. The kids were suddenly very unsure about following this new acquaintance. So that was the first half of the Great Hodag Hunt. Um, and this here is the Hodag that was described in the story. It's local lore from um, the Rhinelander area. Um, so this was done by Rosie Minster. She's the artist who did the beautiful artwork on the cover of the book. And for each of the stories, the chapter starts with, um, with a picture. Let me find another one. So this is for the next story, The Boogeyman. So she did all this beautiful artwork. Um, and both the, the book and posters of all the artwork from the book are available on our website, callingcardbooks.com. Um, yeah, so thank you for joining us for Power of Storytime. We hope you'll join us again on Wednesday at noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. or yeah, 3 p.m. Eastern time to read Passage of New Speech. And then we'll be, be back again Friday at 5 to read either the second half of this story or potentially another one of our books. Thanks for joining.